Good evening, everyone, and thanks again for joining us for this Monday's edition of Alaska Weather. I'm Dave Percy, a meteorologist with the National Weather Service, and I'll be hosting today's show. First graphic is fire danger chart. 17 new fires in the last 24 hours, and uh, being the start of the week, it's got uh, 17 so far this week. Otherwise, uh, statewide, uh, 239 so far total and then uh, acres burned statewide over well over a hundred thousand now 117,097 fire danger not really all that bad there has been some precipitation the last 24 hours up over the upper Yukon Valley but uh, let's see third of an inch fell at Fort Yukon for example so that kind of uh, dampened out the extreme area but it's still extreme up in that area in the shaded the red shaded zone there right about the Yukon River and then up the Porcupine River over toward the border high to very high fire danger surrounding that area and uh, really laid down around Fairbanks still there's a high fire danger area right around the Fairbanks area itself and then some high fire danger showing up now on the north slope there on the west side and also like the Notak Valley along the northwest coast and some areas as there has been kind of uh, varying here for the last few weeks over the Seward Peninsula. And moving on to the, let's see, opportunity for feedback. Have you ever been confused by all the watches, warnings, and advisories? Learn more about a proposal to simplify our alerts and take our brief survey to let us know what you think. It's a nationwide uh, public survey and it'll be open until August 21st, 2020. And uh, surveymonkey.com is the site you'd want to go to to take the survey. And from there, there are no watches, warnings, or advisories anywhere around the state for the next 24 hours. Uh, real quiet weather, uh, storm systems aren't that strong or too far away to uh, produce any advisories, watches, or warnings. So looking good for the next uh, day or two. There are uh, clouds continuing to move westward there from Canada, uh, upper high pressure over the Northwest Territories and easterly flow, uh, circulating some moisture, but not a whole lot. Another kind of a band there of mostly mid and high level clouds coming westward from Prince William Sound, northward to Fairbanks, and also some thunderstorms developing uh, right along the Alaska Range and extending to an area just uh, west of Bethel in a narrow band there along that cloud shield as you can see along the looks like it's uh, kind of developing along the Alaska Range also the Kuskokwim Mountains showers up in the northwest as well light rain at Kotzebue as well as uh, I believe it was Cape Lisbon had some light rain but it's partly sunny Arctic Village mostly sunny in the upper Yukon Valley with uh, varying amounts of clouds, temperatures upper 70s to lower 80s. Uh, Beaver, 82 degrees at 3 p.m. with uh, near 80 degree temperatures both at Fort Yukon and over at Eagle. Otherwise, uh, 60s and 70s, South Central Alaska and the Kenai Peninsula. And kind of clouding up Kodiak Island with a risk of a shower down on the south side possibly developing. And showers in Prince William Sound uh, I brought about uh, 1,800, two tenths of an inch in the last 12 hours to Cordova. Valdez had a hundredth of an inch. You can see uh, kind of the uh, enhanced area of clouds there. It extends into the Gulf, and then showers really tapering off, but still a lot of clouds around the Panhandle. But rainfall amounts weren't all that much today, especially during the daytime. Uh, Wrangell, Petersburg picked up a few hundredths, and that was about it. And there's some partial clearing out over Unalaska and Savunga and Gamble reporting clear skies today. And generally just clouds along the southwest coast in that area with uh, mostly sunny skies over the Cuscombe Valley. And really not a lot going on out over the Aleutians. Light winds, areas of low clouds, fog, some areas of clearing as well. And rolling this through again, you can see that uh, 
weak system kind of falling apart as it pulls west of the prairie loss very weak just a trough actually and another system south of the alaska peninsula that's going to be not moving a whole lot just slowly drifting northward over the next several days and then kind of stalling out over the peninsula that's going to throw several surges of moisture northeastward into the north gulf coast and toward the panhandle uh, over the next uh, couple of days as well otherwise there's the thunderstorms developing uh, by early to mid-afternoon of course that'll be a lot more extensive here in the next few hours but right now they were from uh, well actually extending uh, northeast to southwest there as i mentioned to west of bethel an area of light rain and fog out uh, near Nunavak Island and a weak trough with some moisture but nothing significant into the central Aleutians and showers uh, trying to develop their southern Kodiak Island all in response to that front farther to the south area of light rain drizzle and fog uh, in a developing mode along the Alaska Peninsula not really spilling into Prince or to uh, Bristol Bay yet and then the showers scattered around the pan and also some clearing there as well and looking at uh, tonight's forecast, that low gradually just barely moves a little bit, moves some off to the northeast. That's going to keep a chance of rain for the Alaska Peninsula, and eventually it'll become better chances of rain as that southerly flow between the low center and the high center farther to the east there, southwest of the Queen Charlotte's, just pulls a lot of moisture northward. So rain's a pretty good bet by morning along the south and uh, east side of Kodiak Island and into the state airport area and a trough coming down across the Bering Sea keeps it uh, kind of drizzly and foggy from the Perbilov spreading down to possibly Unmak Island and Atka otherwise low clouds fog or drizzle or a combination of uh, one of the three uh, will uh, pre be pretty much widespread over all, all of the Bering Sea and the Aleutians and IFR also forecast out in the Gulf of Alaska with that ridging and light wind condition there for tomorrow, thunderstorms again uh, up over the interior. Looks like they'll be farther to the north and to the northwest uh, and to a lesser extent. Uh, call it north of the Alaska Range uh, and west of uh, the Cusco Mountains, I guess. Uh, could be some isolated thunderstorms developing along the Alaska Range in the afternoon. Otherwise, not a lot of change there. Again, some showers scattered around the southeast coast with ridging right along the coast. Rain and wind, Kodiak Island, and breezy and unsettled for the Alaska Peninsula with that slow-moving low center uh, gradually pulling northward, and that front will get kicked northeastward and bring a pretty good shot of rain into uh, southern Cook Inlet, Kamishak Bay, and uh, into the Aleutian Range, as well as the southern Kenai Peninsula with rain spreading up into uh, heaviest eastern Prince William Sound, Seward over to Cordova, and uh, pushing into Yakutat late in the day and that ridging up uh, over the panhandle. It's trying to hold back that uh, moisture. It should reach the coastline by afternoon. Otherwise, just a few isolated showers over the inland areas. And thunderstorms again along that trough axis in the interior. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. First line weather graphic for Tuesday morning. IFR, Central Eastern, Beaufort Sea Coast, marginal on the west side. And IFR from the Bering Strait down to across the Bering Sea to the Aleutians and marginal VFR from Amchitka Island westward to the Komodorskis. Otherwise, the interior, not too bad. Possible IFR there uh, along the Alaska Range and then down toward uh, the Wrangell Mountains into Prince William Sound, North Gulf Coast. Gulf of Alaska, all IFR. And southern Kodiak Island, south side of the Alaska Peninsula marginal VFR for the panhandle and for the afternoon that IFR zone pulls back along with the marginal VFR up along the Arctic coast but uh, stays put out over the Bering Sea St. Lawrence Island and now expands out westward to Shimianatu and both north and south of the Alaska Peninsula Bristol Bay VFR marginal VFR possible Cook Inlet uh, moisture rolling in with the IFR now across all of Kodiak Island except for the southwest corner and IFR also pushing, trying to push into uh, Southern Cook Inlet might catch uh, Port Moeller, uh, but Seldovia Homer should be marginal as well as Iliamna. And then from about Anchor Point on up to uh, Palmer or into the interior will be VFR with a marginal VFR, Western Prince William Sound and uh, Southern uh, Copper River Basin while the Panhandle becomes VFR. And VFR continues for the southeast coast through Wednesday morning. 
But uh, more moisture working in areas of marginal VFR pushing up to the Alaska Range, but uh, Cusquam Valley and the uh, mid and upper Tananaw Valley, as well as the upper Yukon Valley, Brooks Range, all the way out to, uh, let's see, Dead Horse and Kaktovik VFR. And then some uh, VFR, Seward Peninsula, up across the Noatak Valley, IFR, Central Eastern Arctic Coast, down into the North Slope and possibly into the Northeastern Koyukuk Valley. No change out west. Bristol Bay, though, IFR, Kodiak, IFR, all along the North Gulf Coast. And for Wednesday afternoon, VFR for the Southeast Coast, marginal VFR hanging right along the coast, Port Alexander on up. Uh, Maybe Elfin Cove, but uh, marginal VFR Yakutat in the North Gulf Coast, Prince William Sound again, and Southern Copper River Basin. With IFR uh, s trying to push into Kamishak Bay, definitely over Kodiak Island, and uh, areas of marginal VFR along the West Coast with uh, no change over the Bering Sea. And for Anatovic, look for VFR flying tomorrow. Risk of a thunderstorm, same forecast for Adigan, but drop the thunderstorm. I don't think they'll see any there. And just a risk for uh, Anatovic. Lake Clark and Merrill, VFR, chance of thunderstorms, maybe western entrance. Same forecast for Rainy. And Windy, VFR, Isabel, VFR, Mentasta, VFR, Tanita, also VFR. Portage, though, uh, I'll go marginal tomorrow. But Chilkoot and White, VFR. Freezing levels, 10,000 feet along the eastern border there, but some cooler air aloft coming in off the uh, Gulf. 6,000 feet across south central Alaska on down the southeast coast, as well as Bristol Bay in the central and uh, southern Bering Sea and the Aleutians. Icing, rime, freezing level 14,000 feet coming up with that uh, moisture band up to Kodiak Island, some of which could be considerable moderate due to some terrain enhancement there. Otherwise, the interior icing, that's uh, more of a mixed uh, convective type uh, thing going on there. Freezing level 16,000 feet, give or take on that one, depending on how high the buildups go, but I don't think anybody flies through uh, CBs. And for the uh, jet stream, Upper level low there coming in toward the eastern Aleutians is going to hang around for a few days out there and really not move a whole lot once it kind of gets set into place there, maybe four or five days in that position. And so that's going to uh, tend to pull the jet northward, the Pacific jet, 120 knots just south of Kodiak Island, one branch breaking off going around the upper level high over the Great Slave Lake, 50 to 70 knots there, the other branch diving well to the southeast. 9,000 feet, low pressure south of the Alaska Peninsula at this elevation with southeast flow, Kodiak Island into Bristol Bay turning easterly, Nunavak Island and northerly for the central Aleutians. About the same pattern uh, at 3,000 feet, higher pressure over the western Bering Sea, turbulence wise. Look for uh, isolated moderate chop, uh, Bristol Bay, Lake Iliamna, southern Cook Inlet, all the way out to the eastern Aleutians. And uh, possibly for northern Cook Inlet, Turnigan Arm, and after the break, I'll be back with the marine forecasts. When you think of a national park, you probably envision wide open natural spaces undisturbed by human activity. There are indeed such places, but even in some of the most remote areas of a place like Kenai Fjords National Park in Alaska, the mark of man is present. Marine debris is a menace to the farthest reaches of our globe, and even designated national park lands are not immune. In the summer of 2009, the Resurrection Bay Conservation Alliance, a grassroots conservation organization based in Seward, Alaska, decided to do something about the marine debris fouling the beaches of Kenai Fjords National Park. Marine Debris Coordinator Tim Johnson had first-hand experience with the issue. The summer before, uh, my wife and I, Michelle, had done a paddle from Seward, a uh, sea kayak paddle from Seward to Homer. Really, our eyes were open to some areas that we didn't realize there was so much accumulation. It was very deceiving up front. You couldn't really get a feel for the, the extent and impact of it. You've got this, this, this nice high tide line that's quite pristine and you really don't get a picture for the, the impact, the amount of uh, debris in that area until you get behind those storm berms, you get back into the lagoons and the, the vegetation around those lagoons. 
And then you see the, the absolute extent back into that veg and how intertwined and enmeshed um, these decades of trash deposition. So we were just appalled by that and said we, we got to get something together on a larger scale. The Resurrection Bay Conservation Alliance is a local um, nonprofit community organization and they have been instrumental in helping um, the Park Service obtain funding to, to get uh, a boats, larger boats to help move the debris and they get volunteer labor and organize the work trips and so it's really a partnership between the Park Service and the community to help get out and really get a project done that in and of itself any one group couldn't do it on their own. Most of that trash was baggable, however, there were large items, huge, you know, piles of hauser line, uh, for example, that, you know, we just had to hoist up onto the boat. The volunteers didn't just bag, haul, and hoist the garbage, but also carefully recorded what types of debris were collected. In many ways, the debris itself is a resource. Um, archaeologists use middens, the trash heaps, um, as a way of analyzing past cultures, and in one sense, Marine debris is a form of a midden. It's a trash heap that left for the future would be something that people could use to analyze our cu culture. It may not say the best things about our culture or the, everything that we want, but we need to be able to document what we've done um, so that we can preserve that legacy, um, make sure that we as a society don't forget what we've, what we've been doing. We had two larger categories of, of, of marine debris that we picked up. Um, commercial fishing um, means like, um, say, uh, gill nets, um, large hauser lines, anything that, that would be associated with more of a commercial fishing scale. And then the second category was, was more recreational fishing and household, you know, which would be you know, general plastics, um, you know, things like that. Um, so we had about a 75% of the commercial fishing uh, marine debris element and about 25% of the recreational and household further out the bay, and we had the exact opposite the closer we got to Seward uh, within the bay. It was about 25% commercial uh, fishing versus 75% recreational fishing and, and household. The trash is not just unsightly for park visitors, but also poses threats to wildlife and marine habitat. Really one of the larger issues now that you go to this plastic that has, uh, can really get into the food web and affect the food web differently than something like glass. These substances, for instance, all these polystyrene blocks that are breaking down into all these little crumbly bits are, are further breaking down on a microscopic level and uh, how much of an impact that has, you know, in this ecosystem is yet to be determined, but I think it's got pretty high potential. You know, well known the sea turtles will eat plastic bags floating in the water. They look like jellyfish to a sea turtle and um, obviously a plastic bag doesn't uh, go well in the digestive system of a turtle. Um, albatross will see small pieces of plastic floating on the surface and think they're small fish and other food sources and eat that in their stomachs, especially in some of the 
um, northwestern Hawaiian islands, it, they, they'll find dead albatross that have starved to death with a full stomach and it's full of pl pieces of plastic. We're affecting our local areas this way, uh, but we need to be thinking about it from more of a state and, and, and global international uh, scale. And, and most importantly, to, to try and focus on prevention of it coming in, in the first place. Because we're just going to see this continuing you know, to build up on our beaches unless we're able to, to get a little bit more of an approach on, on prevention on the front end. Marine debris is really a global problem um, you know, in all the oceans, and you know, there are many different sources. Global shipping is one. Fishing debris from commercial fishing, um, recreational boating activity, activity on land, stuff blowing off land, washing down streams, people just throwing stuff on the shore. Though the problem can seem overwhelming, Johnson remains upbeat about making a positive difference. No, you gotta, you gotta start local. You gotta, you know, take control of what you can do, and 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 make something with that, and and try and you know move on from there. Overall, more than nine tons of debris was removed from the beaches of Kenai Fjords National Park and transported back to Seward to be deposited in a landfill. People gave a lot to the project in order to make it happen. That was um, awesome. One of the most amazing experiences I've ever um, had. Being able to put that that large of a group of volunteers together, dedicated um, volunteers to put that much effort and, and give that much time and pull all these the different agencies together to see it all happen um, was, yeah, it was, it was incredible. It was really incredible. Yeah, very fulfilling um, experience. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. Uh, looking at the marine forecast, we've got northwest winds at 15 knots for the uh, south coast of the Panhandle there with six foot seas, and west at 10 knots, six foot seas on the north coast. Lynn Canal, south 15, same thing for Stevens Passage with seas in those two zones at three feet. Lighter winds southeast 10 for Clarence Strait. And moving on to Wednesday, Southeast winds, 10 knots for all of the inside water areas from uh, Clarence Strait right on up through Lincoln Island Glacier Bay. Southeast winds along the outer coastline as well, 15 knots there along Prince of Wales Island. Otherwise, uh, the remainder of the coastline, southeast 20 with seven to eight foot seas. And for Cook Inlet, Northern Cook Inlet, southwest breeze at 10 tomorrow afternoon with three foot seas. And pretty light winds, uh, from the southwest for the eastern North Gulf Coast, southeast at 10 for Prince William Sound, seas at 2 feet. And then winds coming up to 25 knots for small craft advisories for both Kamishak Bay and the Barren Islands, seas building to 7 to 10 foot, 7 to 10 foot seas building in those areas, and uh, east of 20 for the western North Gulf Coast with 5 foot seas. Even in, uh, stronger winds in store for Wednesday, Kamishak Bay gale warnings. East 35 knots, seas 13 feet, southeast 30 for the Barren Islands, east 30 for the North Gulf Coast with 11 to 12 foot seas, and Prince William Sound. East 25 knots, small craft advisories there with four foot seas, and small craft advisories Cook Inlet for northeast winds 25 knots north of the Forelands, 30 knots, southern Cook Inlet. And Kodiak Island tomorrow, east northeast at 30 knots, 9 to 10 foot seas. We've got small craft advisories for Bristol Bay and the Alaska Peninsula for 25 knot winds there. And for Wednesday, southeast 25 on the uh, east side of Kodiak Island, otherwise for uh, Shelikoff Strait, east at 30. And east 30 mm -hmm. for Bristol Bay, north 25 knots on the Bering Sea side of the peninsula, and west 25 on the south side. Fox Islands, un or Unalaska Island, uh, 20 to 25 knot northwest winds tomorrow. Unmak Island, northwest 15, Adak and Atka, northwest 20. And Damchitka, Kiska, northwest 15, and Shimia and Atu, northwest 10. West 15 for the far western zone, Kiska to Shimia on Wednesday. 20 knot winds from Ramchitka from the northwest extend all the way to about Nikolski. Then on Alaska Island, looking at uh, small craft advisories with west northwesterlies 25 to 30 knots and 7 foot seas. 
And for the southwest coast, uh, along the Yukon Delta coast, winds will be out of the north tomorrow at 15 knots. He's only at 2 feet. And Cuscoquam Delta Coast, northeast 20 with 3 foot seas. Light winds for the Pervilofs and St. Matthew Island. Southerlies at 10 with 2 to 3 foot seas. And north 10 for Norton Sound. Northeast for Norton Sound on Wednesday, but still light. 10 knots, seas pretty slight. St. Lawrence Island, north 15. Same thing for St. Matthew Island. Northwest 20 for the Pervilofs. Small craft advisories, Cuscoquam Delta Coast, south of Nunavik Island. Uh, 25 knots out of the northeast and... Yukon Delta Coast East at 15. <clears throat> and for the uh, Central Eastern Bulford Sea Coast, Northeast Breeze tomorrow, 15 knots, seas to 2 feet in the open at waters. And Northeast 20 knots with 4 foot seas in open waters there for the Western Arctic Coast, all the way down to Cape Thompson, then North 10, south of Cape Thompson, and seas pretty slight. Taking a look at Wednesday. 20 knot winds there uh, over toward demarcation point in the far eastern zone. Otherwise, the central coast, about 15 out of the northeast. West side point lay down to Cape Beaufort, northeast 20. Small craft advisories, Cape Beaufort to Cape Thompson, 25 knots sustained northeasterlies, and then north 15 for the uh, area from Cape Thompson to Wales. And for tonight, low clouds and fog, pretty widespread uh, anywhere along the Arctic coast, anywhere in the Chukchi Sea, Bering Strait, St. Lawrence Island, all the Bering Sea, all of the Aleutians, with some rain drizzle, fog thrown in as well, or any one of the three there for the Perbloffs and maybe to the central eastern Aleutians, but more general area rain or that low center will begin to spread and move northward, especially on the east side of Kodiak Island. And tomorrow that system rolls right into Kodiak with a good shot of rain and a definitely increase in the winds, all those areas as we just saw in the marine forecast. Thunderstorms once again over the interior, but nothing too widespread, showers uh, as well and kind of showery for the panhandle. And then on Wednesday, low pressure drifts up to the Alaska Peninsula. It's gonna probably stick around for four or five days and stays breezy and showery for the uh, Kodiak area and rain approaches the southeast coast. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.